start with <laughs> acknowledging that while beauty is unquantifiable, we do have something in mind when we're referencing the word. Mm. So what are you referencing when you talk about beauty in your book and also in yours? Mm. Um, I think the way that I've found useful to think about it is whether or not how somebody presents um, ticks the boxes that their time and place consider worthy of reward. Oof. So I don't even, yeah, reading and researching so much from my essay really did give me a new way of thinking, even just in terms of language and thinking and speaking, let alone writing about these issues. Um, and I think one of the reasons I was interested to dig a bit deeper into the example of Victoria's Secret in particular is because if we're talking about ticking boxes in this sort of time and place, in terms of sort of like Australia slash at least US, UK, apex of that very sort of commercial perfect version of beauty, that's what ticks every single box. Carly? Um, I wrote about beauty in terms of appearance diversity um, in that people like me, people with facial differences, skin conditions, disability, are very rarely seen in the media. And if we are, it's always um, sensationalist and dehumanising. So in the last two years, I have, or three years, I've made a bit of a tally of some headlines around people with ichthyosis, the skin condition I have, and they're really dehumanising. They're like snakeskin woman, um, reptile, you know, or mermaid baby. Um, there was one that was super dehumanising, like baby with plastic skin. Mm. And um, when, I guess when parents want to raise awareness of these, um, these conditions in the media, they, or in general, they rush to the media to think that it's going to be better, but the media makes it worse for people like me, um, mm. for, for, for our community. And so I looked at that, I, I looked at people who are appearance diverse, and I also talked about people with beauty privilege, people who are in the media a lot. Um, I, I have that privilege um, now because I write about this stuff, um, but I, I've never done a modelling campaign, or it's very rare that um, somebody like me would be in a um, you know glossy magazine. And so, I, you know, I, I fight to change that and I fight for our right to be humanised and mm. respected. And it's interesting, though, because I feel like the average person might be able to acknowledge that they're not the standard of beauty, but within this substandard or side standard, we have permissions that others might not, and it's within that privilege that we have to kind of acknowledge what responsibility we have to, to say that, like, privilege outside of the standard still exists, mm -hmm. and how do we navigate that? Mm. I also want to discuss, you know, when did you first realise that beauty as a concept was something that would have affected you? Because I'm really interested in, you know, programming and how we've been programmed by people around us and the media and patriarchy and capitalism and all these things. But as individuals, was there a turning point that made you think, oh, I am beautiful or I might not be considered beautiful or just the concept in itself? Yeah, I mean... I think it was when I kept on seeing anti-dandruff ads in magazines mm -hmm. as, like, as a kid and noticing that um, people with flaky scalps were um, undesirable or wouldn't get work or couldn't find love. And, um, and I have a very flaky scalp. My mum would spend hours um, a week combing the skin out of my scalp. I, I do that now. And um, that kind of advertising suggests that people who have flaky scalps um, you know, are undesirable. And also that I never saw anyone like me in... Um, in the media until I wrote myself into the media. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> and that is the blueprint. <laughs> and I don't want to see another article about ichthyosis unless I've written it. Yes. <laughs> but I also want to stop writing about it, you know? Well, that's what I was getting to, because also we talk about media representation, but often the representation isn't representative. So, mm. you know, perhaps if you're seeing black women in the media, you're seeing a Beyonce, which benefits from quite Eurocentric beauty standards, and we don't have very much in common. And so when people see, well, she's one of the biggest musicians in the world, and she's black, sure, you can see that there aren't inequalities with the conversation about black women, but there are. Mm. Similarly, like you said, you had representation in some areas, but it was dehumanising. And so how do we kind of navigate asking for more but putting boundaries around how we're given more? Mm. Um, I'm seeing a really amazing young woman, Jay Zagari, in America who has ichthyosis and she's a black woman and she's just been modelling for Target and she's mm. done some um, bikini modelling and that's the first time I've seen someone with ichthyosis with a lot of uh, body surface on mm. display 
um, in the media that hasn't been told to cover up. It's amazing. Mm. Her uh, Instagram is lyrically diverse. You should follow her right there now. There we go. Plugs. <laughs> and what do you think about, I guess, the contradictions of... I think about what it is to be a woman and how even though society may be inherently telling us that we're not good enough, we mostly have a lot of cushioning around us to protect us from that. Maybe a friend or a family member who, despite what society says, can remind us that, you know, you two are great and you two are beautiful. But what happens when we grow up and realise that capitalism is a thing and beauty intersects with success and privilege and ambition in a way that you hadn't really seen before and we're not generally prepared for? And I know you wrote about this a lot in your book, Brie, the intersection of beauty and ambition and beauty and success. And so. Mm. I'd love for you to tell the audience a bit about, you know, how mm. you manage that. Um, something I found really difficult about writing... Oh, Siri. Um, <laughs> Join in, Siri. <laughs> listening all the time. Um, something I found really difficult writing about and then uh, sharing in beauty um, is how I am complicit in a system that I complain about. Mm -hmm. um, it's very... F I really struggle. I mean, the, the narrative arc of beauty takes place when I was touring Eggshell Skull. Um, and I, in hindsight, I mean, nobody was more surprised than I by how Eggshell Skull sort of exploded or it felt like to me like it did. And I was on um, television and, um, you know, in a magazine and was not ready for any of that. Um, and realised that I had been given this incredible platform, which, like, as Carly said, you, you, when you either you receive a platform or, you know, you work to create it and you can do really good and important things with that. I decided that I would try and get some law reform in my state, home state. Um, and then I felt really conflicted because I realised that the more I used my face mm. and my body and my image, the more traction, not just something like my Instagram or my Twitter might receive, but I couldn't get stories up, even with incredible places like ABC, unless I had like new headshots or new um, visuals to go alongside these really critical issues. Um, and something I grappled with then and still grapple with now is how to be responsible and considerate in benefiting from looking like this, however much that is, even speaking like this, being able to speak because I just always got to driven to debating lessons, mm -hmm. like everything. Not, I, I just feel really strongly that you, could, you should be able to be a great writer or a great advocate, a great policy maker, a great citizen, an active citizen, without having to straighten your hair mm -hmm. or um, be able to present on television in a way that is expected by the camera and the viewer at home. And how much am I contributing to a system that expects that of other people by using it to my advantage. Mm -hmm. But what is also the case is that if I didn't sort of... Um, I, got, I feel like I got a wedge in the door and then I was just like elbowing in yeah. and elbowing in and elbowing in. That WD-40, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, creaking. <laughs> I'm not sure we would have gotten the referral unless I was just... This is like the referral for law reform and stuff. If, if I hadn't just hit it so hard all the time. And so the question for people like me, I suppose, is that could you ever punch these numbers into a calculator and feel like the bad you were contributing was outweighed by the good you're trying to achieve with it? Like, but those, how can you even trust that you're the right person to do those numbers? Like, it's just there are more questions than answers that I have. And it's also being able to, to analyse the world you're in from a critical lens that's current, not aspirational. So in an aspirational world, maybe we wouldn't have to be sitting on a stage, you know, dressed up and with makeup on, and we would still be heard and regarded as people allowed to be up here. Mm. But what we know is, for now, is that people do reward beauty, mm. and people reward conventional beauty. Mm. And so you start to wonder, what, is, what are we fighting against now, when in the same breath we're saying, these are the boundaries that we have to abide by, and we don't like them, but we'll do them anyway. Mm. What kind of message are we sharing with that? And the rewards are so varied and insidious. Like the halo effect, this widely acknowledged thing that people who, again, the way I describe it, people who tick enough boxes, you know, that fit alongside whatever their time and place calls beautiful, they, people presume they are more hardworking, they are Ooh. more competent, they are more intelligent. And the inverse is true. It's why people who are going for jobs, if they're fat, they get 
people make implicit judgments about somebody who is fat being lazy and mm -hmm. lacking self-control. Anything that exists in the positive has an equivalent in the negative. And like, there are so many punishments, in particular, I would say, for women who don't tick the boxes. Mm. The halo effect is much more magnified for women than it is for men. Yeah, and women who sit at that intersection of not being just women, but women of colour, mm. or queer women, or women with a disability, suddenly it's not as simple as my oppression lies in my womanhood, but suddenly all these other intersections that award me opportunity in some areas and then take it away from me in other areas. Mm. I start to wonder, though, because I can't help but think about perhaps, you know, would I feel better or worse about myself if I could see people like me in the media? Like, what are we actually advocating for in that sense? And, you know, Brie, I want to ask you, by seeing people who looked like you in the media and people who were able to do what you do, write and share stories, had you ever considered that what you looked like would be such an intersecting um, parallel with what you were able to share? And had you ever considered that you wouldn't be able to just be, it would be this intersection of what do you look like and how does that intersect with what happened to you? Because it's I, a tricky one. Yeah, I think I had thought about it in terms of a sort of broad sense of privilege. Yeah. Um, I knew, for example, that um, my like education and upbringing made it much easier for somebody who has everything that I have to write a book and to have that book be published mm. and have that book be taken seriously, et cetera. But I just, yeah, I did not realise the appearance thing until the book was out in the world and it was very much learning on the job. Um, and I really feel that something I tried to communicate with Eggshell Skull was if this is how hard the system is to navigate for somebody like me who has everything that I have, mm. what is it like for somebody who doesn't have everything I have? And I feel the same with beauty where um, the fact that... Like, I just spoke to so many people whose mothers were the first persons that ever put them on a diet. Right. When they were children. Um, and I, like, none of my insecurities or struggles with my body ever came from anything to do with my parents. And I just think about how much I have and yet how hard I still found it. Um, yeah, I... That's, I guess, one of the reasons why I wanted to write both books. Yeah. Yeah. And on the topic of writing books, I struggle with, you know, I couldn't, couldn't imagine being in a position where you have given your, both of yourself so freely in your writing and you've almost exposed yourself to the world. And although I can understand that process would be cathartic for some, it could almost be quite triggering to have to keep on talking about yourself in an observational way, like, this is how people have responded to me because of this and this and this. And so, although the process of writing might be cathartic, then you have to share this book with the world. And you're reminded um, of all the things that you were trying to avoid in the process. So, mm. I know we spoke about, um, before this panel, about how it's amazing that people are inquisitive about your skin condition. It becomes like a spectacle, and the curiosity crosses a line. And so how do you think people should navigate the boundary between wanting to know more and also turning you into an object for observation? Yeah, I mean, I've got two things here. I did a talk a few years ago um, with Celeste Little and Joe Stanley, and it was for International Women's Day. And on stage, I, I was obviously scratching you know, subconsciously, not mm. realising, because it's something I do all the time. And in the, um, at, the, at the end, I was, was meeting some new people, and um, a woman came up to me, and she starts scratching my arm like this. And she said, um, can I give you a scratch? What? And I think she got so familiar with me on stage talking about appearance diversity and the importance of representation and, and also me scratching that she thought that was helpful. <laughs> and uh, just odd. And it's funny because so, so many people avoid me because they're, you know, scared it's contagious mm. or scared that they'll hurt me. But then I got this. Um, that was really odd. Uh, and then the other thing is I found that when I wrote Say Hello... Um, it put distance between the reader and I when I was writing about ableism. So I mostly wrote online before I wrote a book. 
And if I was to talk about some discrimination that happened to me, like a taxi driver not taking me um, because he's scared that my face would ruin his car, which has happened 10 times in the last year, um, I often get the secondary level of ableism online when I write about it. So people will say, oh, of course he was scared of your face, he's never seen it before. Or, you know, um, of course that, that's his car, he, he deserves, you know, he, he deserves the right to keep it clean. Or um, maybe you were overreacting, maybe, maybe you just misheard. And, um, but when I wrote about the things in my book, and there were two things that I hadn't written, maybe three, but there were maybe three or, yeah, I think three things that I hadn't written about before online. And um, so, so they were the difficulty I had with travelling overseas um, and the, uh, the way that I had to fight when I got to Heathrow, not physically, but verbally argue with the um, attendant. Um, who um, who just would not let me get the extra leg room I had called for six weeks prior um, to travel home to Australia. And I knew if I'd written about that online, I would have got that secondary level of ableism. The other thing I wrote about was the difficult interview with um, the radio announcer in Melbourne who said that my face would be great at Halloween. Um, and I, didn't, I hadn't written about that much aside from um, being in the media because I didn't want to inflame it anymore. And so I wrote about that because my editor asked me to. And the third thing that I wrote about was a man who also has ichthyosis, who was harassing me online for three years and I took him to court. And it was probably because of Bree's book, actually, that um, I went to her launch in June 2018, um, that I had the courage to do that. You were, you were one of the reasons. Um, and I wrote about that because I hadn't written about that much online. So, but that really put the distance because I have never had it and someone, someone sent me an email to tell me off about those three things as no. I would if I wrote them online. Could you please clarify or elaborate with secondhand ableism? Because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of the culture around being ableist mm -hmm. is that well, I didn't say anything out of tact. I just, <laughs> I just said what I thought, and surely that's allowed. <laughs> and so we've, we're teetering this line between free speech mm -hmm. and uh, and the option to have an opinion. Yeah. And often those two don't really intersect. Yeah. And oh, so, like I'm just saying it to be helpful, or maybe you haven't thought of that before. Mm. <laughs> mm. So, yeah. I if mean, we had to <laughs> spell out what is secondhand. <laughs> ableism and how does it manifest? Yeah, I mean, ableism is discrimination towards disabled people. Mm. And then the secondhand stuff is that devil's advocate. And mm. often when I write something at the end, I'll be like, no devil's advocates, please. And then I have a house rules at the, at the top of my Facebook. And if people break that, I'll be like, hey, have you seen the house rules? Um, and then I'll just block, block, block. Um, mm. Because I just, <laughs> I just don't want to have We had time, time today. Uh, <laughs> I just don't have time to to endure that, to endure someone else's opinion about my mine or other people's trauma, mm. you know, and um, and often um, it's it's when I share something about somebody like ableism or discrimination that happens to someone else, and people are arguing about that, I feel worse for that other person right. that you know is a subject to that when people are arguing and um, kind of denying their their experience. Yeah, mm. I feel like it's a real denial of experience. And I feel like there is no blanket answer, but I will ask you on behalf of the audience, what is the correct way to approach somebody with tact about something they have nothing or no idea on? I feel like, you know, in a lot of environments, we create spaces for open discussion, but that privilege is not really used as best as it can be. And so we've opened up the pool for discussion, <coughs> the boundaries have been crossed, and now we're closing ourselves mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. And often we can understand that in order to move move these conversations forward. People need to get involved, but it's hard to keep policing yeah. how and when and what's the yeah. right medium. Yeah, I, I just um, did a little, uh, uh, I don't know, education session for the Emerging Writers Festival staff. And one of the things that I said was, it's really important that you protect your writers um, when they're just coming off stage because that's the time that they're going to get someone that goes, hey, I didn't want to ask this in public, but, you know, I, I lecture at Melbourne University sometimes, um, like once a year in, in the medical school. I'm that not counts. even a doctor, um, but that counts, right? <laughs> um, and I have had some really weird experiences with students. And one of those experiences was um, a couple of years ago, I talked about um, disability pride and how when you when a doctor is seeing a patient um, with a, a difference, a genetic difference, um, or a parent, they really need to encourage pride in their um, in their child and um, you know, I'm not I'm not one for cures or to change my appearance through drugs that will make me worse than I am now. And so I talked about that and how long it took me to come to um, you know, accept myself and self love. 
And this woman afterwards, a uh, first year medical student, um, she says to me, oh, I've got a question, but I didn't want to ask it. Oh, here we go. Mm. And the geneticist... Mm. Great were, start. <laughs> we all know that one. <laughs> the geneticist was standing around me and um, she said to me, if I got pregnant and found out that I had a child with ichthyosis, would I have an abortion? And I said, I've never met you before. And I just talked about pride and um, mm. it's none of your business. And the, the geneticists, both of them, had said, we've never seen such forward um, discussion like this before. And I said, well, you haven't, you know, I clearly haven't been around lots of patients in public because I get this sort of stuff regularly. Mm. Mm. And that's my workplace as well. And it's really hard to set boundaries in my workplace mm. when this happened. You know, I, I don't know about you, but when you get an inappropriate comment, in, yeah, it's just really, yeah, really hard. And how do you navigate it? Obviously, you've had two separate books that talk about um, serious themes, uh, <laughs> serious <laughs> themes, but very personal themes. Like, it's not an observation of a different experience. It's yours. Like, it's mm. your lived experience. And having to write that is one thing. And having someone critique it through their objective lens is another thing. But mm. then when it comes to asking you specifics about your experience that you didn't disclose or, mm. you know, clarification or, you know, a sharing of, of trauma as well, how do you navigate it or what is the best way for someone who doesn't know you to broach that conversation with you? Mm. If it's about questions that they have about the system... <coughs> if it's about questions they have about a system or, or, or a theme or a topic or an issue rather than questions about me specifically. Mm -hmm. I think 101 is just Google it first. <laughs> My um, and see if an answer exists. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that I find helps me when I'm approaching experts, because I freelance journalist and I often need to ask professionals for some of their time to help me. The way I show them respect is by saying, um, I'm writing to you because um, I think you can help me and I, I have something to ask of you. Mm. I have read this paper, this paper, and this paper that you wrote. I do understand this, but what I don't understand is this. If I could have 20 to 30 minutes of your time, these are the types of things I would ask you. Right. You demonstrate with your actions and communicate very clearly what you have done and what you are seeking. And that is how a professional shows another professional respect. Right. If I have written a 110,000 word memoir, that is extremely personal and have not included um, a few pieces of information, that was probably deliberate. Yeah. Um, and I probably will not answer anyone's question via DM on Instagram um, mm. if they are seeking more information. Right. Um, it's... I don't know, it's just one of those things that seems so simple to me. Yeah. Um, and just involves... Like, I think it's like what Carly mentioned, there is what you just said about how it hurt extra or was more difficult to deal with because you were at work. There's something there where I'm like, this is my job, mm. this is what I do. Can we not engage with each other professionally and with respect? Mm. I have a Patreon and PayPal and I say to people, I have a lot of people ask me to do their work for me. Mm. For them, you know, like, can you help me with my assignment? Or and can, you, can you help me talk to my kid about what it's like to look different? And, um, you know, I will say, if this has helped you, you can buy me a drink. You can, um, mm. and I include a link. Or I'll say, I have a book. The other day I had someone um, write to me or, or, like, tweet me and she said, Something like, oh, have you, have you written any resources online? And I said, well, actually, I've got a book and I've got a blog. And then she goes, oh, no, I'm looking for something directed to children. I can't read my child your book. I'm like, but you could read my book. <laughs> you know, you, I, there's a lot of information in there about what kind of books you can read your children in the book. But anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> T. Can I just also add here something I really struggle with, and I would love to hear if either of you actually have figured it out. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> which is that... It turns out that Instagram DMs have been the most valuable and rich way for me to hear from readers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite ironic that sort of the general, like, dominant media landscape slash old dudes are so dismissive of Instagram. Yeah. Because if they knew how many of my followers had sex offenders convicted and talked to each other about it via Instagram DMs, I'm sure they would think differently. Absolutely. The inverse of that is that people will say, people will write and communicate things via an Instagram DM that I am convinced they wouldn't even put in an email because the format has this kind of implicit 
lower level of formality, which yeah. can very easily encourage a lower level of respect and or a heightened level of familiarity. Mm -hmm. How do? <laughs> I would like to turn the question to you. you. <laughs> I also think there's a level of anonymity when it comes to Instagram. I've had many an occasion where somebody has shared their perspective on something with me with the impression that I would understand it and then hold some sacred space for them, which I think is very <laughs> interesting because I don't know you and I feel like um, using us or anybody in a position with a platform as the conduit to you and where you're trying to go <laughs> is really counterintuitive because we are often not the change makers or we're not like the, I don't know, like the oracles of, of justice and truth. Yeah. But also I find that it, it almost illuminates that there often isn't space, you know, and if you've carved out yours, why can't I just kind of, yes. you know, take the path that you've taken? Yeah, I'm sure these people would love a better and proper space to do Absolutely. it. I don't think they want to come to a random on Instagram. Mm. Yeah, I, I get a lot of people telling me their life story or their, you know, diagnosis. And sometimes it's really hard, you know. Um, but I also, yeah, Instagram has been interesting because it's so visual based and it's been the source of the least abuse for me, which is quite lovely. Um, and oh, the other day I was writing on Instagram that um, we went out to see Jonathan Van Ness and my husband and I were on the train and he, as I got off the train, he said to me, did you notice that I stood in front of you so you didn't have to endure the child staring at you? Mm. Well, that's really lovely. So I wrote about this, um, you know, with, with our, um, a photo of us on there. And I, t I changed the story a little bit. I said um, that Adam and I went out and he stood in front of me so that a group of people wouldn't catch my eye staring at me. And I did that because I knew that if I had written child, people would have said, oh, but they're just curious. Children are curious. They deserve to ask questions. They need to know. And I didn't want, again, that's that secondary level of ableism. Anyway, so on Instagram, this woman writes to me, oh, Carly, I think that was me staring at you. I wanted to catch your eye because of your headpiece. Um, and then it was really awkward because I had to DM her to tell her, oh, sorry. It wasn't you. <laughs> I changed the story a little bit. I'm, I'm, and then I felt really dishonest. And you know when you can see people typing mm. and how long they type? She took like 13 minutes to type ah. this tiny <laughs> message. And I was worried that she was going to call me a liar and well, I'm making it public now. But I felt like <laughs> I had to, <laughs> had to change because I knew that I was going to... Um, you know, cop backlash for writing about a child who, you know, people think have a right to intrude. And anyway, mm. um, she was fine and we were fine. I didn't get called out for lying. I'm admitting it now. <laughs> um, and, and then the other day, just on that, mm. my, my, um, I wrote about, I shared an article, I can't remember what it was about now, but I shared an article about, I think it was about emotional labour. And my dad commented and he kind of made this in-joke about how I wrote in my book that he's stoic. And he said something like, you must be stoic like me. And he's, my dad is named Roger Finlay. I am named Carly Finlay. Someone went below him on Facebook and said, if you really knew Carly, you wouldn't be calling a stoic. And, <laughs> and Dad said, I'm Carly's dad. <laughs> and um, if, you have read my, if you have read her book, <laughs> you would know that she called me stoic. And this person continued to argue with my dad, who <laughs> apparently didn't know who I was. Just didn't know you anyway, like it. it was did. quite amusing. And then Mum rang me, do you know this person on your Facebook? I said, no. <laughs> That's what. The justification must get super tiring. Um, and I know, like, I've got so many questions, but I need to kind of like, round out the conversation at hand. But we're rethinking beauty. And oh, yeah. It's tricky, right? <laughs> you would have thought uh, we were just, just having chit chats. Yeah. Um, but then I, I, keep, I had this uh, epiphany is too strong of a word. I had a thought. <laughs> I had a thought. Um, a high quality thought. Yeah, high quality <laughs> thought, a premium thought. Um, <laughs> basically, I was thinking that to acknowledge that we do or don't align with the standard of beauty perpetuates the idea that there is one and mm -hmm. thus encouraging that standard forward in some covert, indirect way. And so if we're going to rethink the idea of beauty, what are we actually after? Are we here to create a new standard? Are we in the business of reclaiming? Are we in the business of re-identifying? Or are we in the business of just letting it go? I've often seen and read that, you know, how to reclaim femininity is to lean more into the masculine. You know, maybe you don't wear makeup and, you know, don't wear 
prints and don't wear colours, and that's how you, you know, get the one Push up on the patriarchy. And then that yeah. doesn't seem realistic either. And so with this conversation, what actionable steps can we take to make sure we have a more nuanced and considered lens on beauty as a construct? Because mm. I talk about the idea of pretty privilege a lot and, and the idea that most of us can find ways to identify, whether that be being slim, being of a certain ethnicity, you know, identifying certain spaces that allow us privileges that other spaces wouldn't have. So a lot of us are able to benefit. So mm. perhaps we aren't really con convinced that we need to work so hard to dismantle the system mm. because then it removes permissions from certain spaces that we've finally just got into. Mm. So, like, what is the point? Well, that's, like, white feminism 101. Also, Ooh. just... <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> um, which is just so sad when you see it happening all the time, which mm. is, like, people who convince themselves that because they have been so downtrodden for so long, any one-upping they can get is, like, morally justifiable. Right. Um, I would like to answer this with something that I, um, just a reflection that I got when I toured beauty, because that was a really valuable experience for me. I've always been very heartened that um, audience question and answer time after events for my events have been one of the most enriching and like sort of mutual learning experiences and people always come with really considered questions that's great. And one of the most common questions I got when I was touring beauty was about the difference between body positivity and body sort of ambivalence or, or kind neutrality. Of neutrality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the only answer I could come to was that people who have previously or currently do still struggle in their bodies that comes from many different places and can be a manifestation of all kinds of different things. And depending on what that is for you, body positivity or body neutrality offer different um, avenues for dealing with it. Mm. So what that means, body positivity is like, if you look in the mirror, you don't like what you see for any reason, you um, try and sort of actively engage with it and say, like, no, the bigness is beautiful. Right. Body neutrality is like, I'm not even going to think about it. Mm. So I feel like it's relevant to your question because if we're asking about completely getting rid of beauty standards, mm. that sort of fits more with the latter. Um, for me, very just personally, because I can only really speak from my personal experience, because I have had such anxiety around my body for so long, it doesn't work for me to just try not to think about it. Right. What works for me is to lean into facets of my life in which I can um, sort of gain a foothold in, in the positive aspects of them. Mm -hmm. So for me, exercise and eating, obviously, huge, like... Mm. <laughs> Warning. <laughs> um, whereas for me, what I found really helpful is finding a new sport and a new um, team or thing that makes me feel good about what my body can do mm. and leaning into cooking and taking all kinds of different cooking classes and learning new and wonderful recipes. Because I know for me personally, it's not an option to just not think about it. Right. And I love that people are now discussing that there are different options and that there is that for some people body positivity is the answer for some people body neutrality is the answer so it's not thinking more or less just thinking a bit more critically about what you're thinking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> push through to the other side <laughs> go into the void yes go into the light and what about you what would you say um i feel like it's very important that we show our real faces mm. wherever we are um, I don't often wear makeup um, I, because I can't. It makes me uncomfortable. Um, but I also feel that it's very, very easy now for us to change our faces. Mm. Before, we were seeing changed faces in magazines of mm. really very beautiful people anyway, and their faces were airbrushed. But now we can do it to ourselves. And so we just took a selfie backstage, and I said, I'm not putting a filter on. One take. I, you know, one mm -hmm. take. Um, I, you know, I feel like we... Um, it, it's very easy for us to change our image. And, and when I watch photos or videos rather of Kim Kardashian's daughter doing her makeup like Kim Kardashian at four years old, I think, wow, what ha, has she even seen her real face? 
has she seen her mother's real face? Mm. Um, I, I think it's very, very easy for us to change. Although um, it, just in the spirit of keeping it real, my husband is so bored with being an Instagram husband um, that he just holds my, his phone up and there, done it. And the other day I did have to use a filter because I actually wasn't as red as I am <laughs> because of the light. So I had to use a filter to make myself look like me mm. um, or else <laughs> because of his, um, yeah stubbornness in being an Instagram <laughs> husband. But I also, yeah, I think it's really, really important. And I also think it's very important for um, people who are appearance diverse, who are comfortable with it, to mm. feel like um, they have a duty of care or an, a bit of an obligation, I guess, to the community to be seen. So for me, it's very important that I am visible. Um, and I realise, I recognise I have thin privilege and I have... Um, you know, class privilege, mm. financial privilege. But I think it's very important that um, I am seen and, and constantly representing, and other people are as well, and then I'm constantly sharing um, other people who aren't seen. And I know um, Kara Leibovich, who's an American writer, I think I think she wrote this. Um, if not, I'm really sorry, Kara, to misquote you, but she wrote about the ugly disabled and how people um, who are who have non-normative bodies and non-normative faces aren't often seen in the media. I think it's really important that we see not only um, people, disabled people who have beauty privilege, but lots of different types of bodies because we don't see that. I shared a, um, an article on my uh, Facebook yesterday around um, lots of different types of women who were photographed and their bodies, you wouldn't see them often in the media and this mm. is such an important thing. You know, often people's bodies that are different uh, only noted as um, specimens in the hospital or worse, you know. Um, mm. And so that's really, really important that all sorts of bodies are seen and all sorts of faces are seen. Um, but also that we have control over that um, and that we are doing it on our own terms and um, that we are, like, I mean, I'm, I'm really passionate or dispassionate around parents oversharing their children who have facial differences and skin conditions because mm. often, you know, the comments that come below them are just awful and the media commentary is awful. And I think people should choose whether they do that or not. But as an adult, I think it's very, very important that we put ourselves out there if we feel confident enough so other people can see what's possible. And... Um, I wrote a piece that just came out today where I talked about um, the importance of representation. And when I did the project last year, a little boy with ichthyosis, um, the same type as I have, so we look quite similar, um, he said um, to his mum, that's Carly, she's my friend, she has skin like me. And, um, she, and Casey sent me a photo of um, her boy watching me on TV. And to know that um, that is possible now compared to when I was a child just means a lot. And we need to see that more. Absolutely. And I'd also like to make a point that almost gets glossed over in the sense that in, as individuals, we can be vehicles of the patriarchy. And when we're operating spaces where we're encountering women who aren't aligning with these patriarchal, patriarchal ideals like we are, we feel slighted by it. Like that woman who didn't wear makeup to work when you thought you had to, or mm. you know, that woman who had dressed up and made you uncomfortable because you're like, I thought we were in it together. Mm. So I think it's, you know, I being, struggle with that sometimes. You know, being mindful yeah. of how we kind of, um, force each other to have these homogenous narratives of womanhood and how we should look like based on what makes us comfortable or uncomfortable. Mm. It's a tricky one. But how about we do audience questions? What better time than the present? So if you have, if you have um, a question, there's a mic over here and a mic over here. And I would encourage people to get up and just join the conversation because there's nothing worse than us just talking at you and wondering if any of this is valuable or if any of this is hitting as intended. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it's a live stream, so it's going to look terrible if nobody gets up. No one's up there. <laughs> also, I think that someone could bring a mic to someone if they cannot walk to the um, Also mic. that. Until we get someone, I have a question. Mm. Kind of about Instagram in general just after what Carly said. For me, mm, the line is very clear that I, I just could not ever imagine downloading an app that, like a Facetune or an app that right. did like editing. But also I acknowledge that if you take 50 photos and pick the one where you're posing to look the slimmest, yeah. like this is, a, this is not a binary, this is a sliding yeah. scale. And then even if you look to a step lesser, like even just putting foundation on is like, could be conceptualized as a filter on the face. Mm. Mm, where, like, where do you draw the line? And why, if you engage to any degree, how can you judge someone at the far end? And yet, I believe that 
like when I was researching beauty, I, I found that like one of the <coughs> biggest factors for someone considering a cosmetic procedure is that they know somebody who just it had has, one. Yeah. So undeniably, we are affecting other people by our own actions. Mm. And also goes back to what you were saying before about the halo effect, how we internalise, you know, our lack of... Uh, our lack of understanding for our own beings is also projected in things like, oh, but I know I wanted to get surgery, but it's not because I hate myself, it's because my friend did it, <laughs> you know? Or mm. I too use filters, but I don't like hate the way I look, it's just because that's the way we need to look. Warmer, tanner, thinner, taller, or whatever it might be. I get asked if I have microdermabrasion a lot. And it's like an excuse for someone to ask me about my skin, like in a weird mm. way. Like instead of asking, have you been sunburned? I usually get this. <laughs> Did you have microdermabrasion? Interesting. I don't know what it looks like to have microdermabrasion, but I imagine it looks like this. Um, it's, that's an interesting comment that I get. Well, dozens of rude people can't be wrong. <laughs> also, um, <laughs> also, also, ichthyosis means that I look very young and... Um, I, for a long, like my skin renews itself. So your skin generally would renew itself once every 28 days and mine renews itself every day. There we go. And um, <laughs> I got invited to my 20, 19 year school reunion because they couldn't count. Um, and anyway, <laughs> I have no, no warm feelings towards school. So, and I'm sure they don't have any warm feelings to me. Um, and uh, they, they invited me to the school reunion. And in the group chat, every time I would speak, someone would either, either change the subject or leave. It was, it was just like being at school. Anyway, so I, I put a photo of me when I was 17 up and a photo of me when I was 37 next to each other. And I'm like, so um, I've just found a photo, an old photo of me when I was 17 and me now. And um, I'd love to see what you look like. Because I looked exactly the same. <laughs> Burn. Do we have any? Oh, we've got two. Which one's number one? Number one. Hi. Thanks, ladies. Thanks for um, excellent conversation and really enriching books. Um, I wanted to ask about what you touched on and whether this is um, a distinction that you'd like to draw out a bit more. And that's the difference now between the personal and the professional. And I find now that because uh, I have a research background and it wouldn't have mattered, they could tell um, perhaps your gender from your papers, <coughs> they wouldn't know what you looked like. Mm. But now people are expected to have a professional profile and it shares often some of their personal life. And it's also a distinction I make with my children is that they will be having a discussion and I'll say, this is personal information. You may not ask these people these questions. It's part of their personal life. Mm -hmm. And I feel like increasingly as my children get to an age where they would like to use some of these platforms, I'll be saying, is this information you want to be sharing or is this your personal information? Is that a useful distinction to make in these online spaces? I find that now, I, I used to work for the government and I had to, I, I believe that my values online really was set by the code of conduct where I couldn't share so much of my stuff. And so, you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't share. But now I work at Melbourne Fringe, which is amazing. And our, all of it kind of blurs into one. And it's very weird to have that where I can now, you know, they, they would probably leverage off my social media profile to share something um, that's happening and, and vice versa. And um, yeah, it's a really weird, weird thing. And also, um, I guess there's a debate around disclosure of disability. Um, and race, etc. And I can't, like, well, like, I disclose just by being, um, by walking into a room, I guess, through being different. But now that I've written so much that a, an employer or a potential employer would, uh, yeah, could find, you know, everything out about me or everything. But you know what I mean? Like, there's so much out there. So it's tricky. Mm. Something I find frustrating is that young people more and more have to engage with and find a way to make cash in the gig economy. And if you are at all, even for 20% of your income, somehow in some version of a gig economy, it is not an option to just opt out of social media. Um, and as soon as you acknowledge that your social media presence has any kind of connection to your earning income or your professional standing, those two things being inextricably connected, well then, again, we just start seeing the compounding of the rewarding of people who look good. And who share. And who share themselves. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I would say that's a particular area of frustration I have when <coughs> I receive judgmental comments from older people who just don't appreciate that um, friends of mine who I've been friends with for, say, uh, five, six, seven years 
who are now sort of comfortable freelance journalists, but who had to put their faces on things a lot in their earlier years to gain social media following so that their stories were more likely to be published because the publications can then leverage off the personal platforms. Mm. Like, these things are all connected, and it's not... You don't get to just opt out because you want to be a serious person. Mm. Or also acknowledging that if you opt out, this is the impact of doing so. Mm. So everybody has choices in regards to what you want to share online and, and what you want to withhold or keep to yourself. Mm. But there is this expectation that the two... It's all about access, right? Like, mm. I want to know, therefore I should know. Mm. And your personal life also impacts the way you're professionally seen in a lot of spaces. So they're interconnected. And also okay. knowing that like a certain amount of social followers will bring a, a physical crowd number as well. Mm. Like, you know, I've been told, oh no, maybe you couldn't fill out that, you know, fill out that sta stadium or whatever. Not stadium, that's ridiculous. I'm talking myself <laughs> but you know what Studio. I mean. Studio. Right, Not studio. yet, Carly. <laughs> <laughs> Although my dad just asked, are you speaking in the main bit of the opera house? I, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to say err on the side of caution, but we just don't know what the negative ramifications will be for what this looks like in 20 years. Will we regret commodifying our personal lives? Maybe, mm. but up until then, it's kind of just like, what do you do to get by? And is the impact of not sharing more worthwhile? I feel about that toward... I feel towards that how I feel about e-cigarettes, which is like, seems like it might not right. be as bad as smoking, mm. but you're still putting something that's not air in your lungs. That's not air. Like, <laughs> we're doing it Thank before we have sufficient peer testing. We got a question review, over here. Yes, we do. Thank you ladies so much for your fabulous conversation. Um, I have a daughter. She is fabulous. I have tried to raise her to be a feminist warrior, but the question that you, you raise for me now is how I've tried very hard to raise her to be the most beautiful being she can be but how do you keep doing that in this society that even though I try to be body proud no matter what I look like and I have physical disabilities that are not easily seen I live with chronic pain so I want my daughter to be strong and proud no matter what her body shape is how do you keep doing that, as you, Bree, said? You know, my daughter is beautiful to me. How do I keep letting her be beautiful no matter what she wants to wear, whether she wants to wear makeup or not? Mm -hmm. And when I inevitably, very soon, get grandchildren, how do I help my granddaughter and or grandson, I might add as well, encourage them to be beautiful inside and out? Mm. I mean, I find there's a lot of pressure with self-love culture because, mm. you know, capitalism tells us to fix ourselves and that in itself produces a lot of self-disdain. I won't say hate, that's a strong word. I know personally that, you know, I'm able to be in a position where I'm validated a lot and I wonder what I would be like, how rich my self-esteem would be if I wasn't consistently validated by people who didn't know me and those who did. And mm. so it's really hard to say what's possible now, because I just don't know how people internalise this kind of attention, you know. I mean, my mum always used to tell me that, like, sometimes she didn't want to almost make me aware of my body, of my race, of my culture, for fear that I would... She couldn't control what I did with that information. So if she said things... I remember I wanted to get my teeth fixed. I've got a gap, Mum, let me get my teeth fixed. And she was like, I don't see it. Like, I don't see what's wrong. And for the longest time, she was, she was gaslighting me, obviously. But it helped, because eventually I just got over it. But the, gaslighting people isn't necessarily mm. the way to manage, <laughs> you know, issues with body. Yeah. And so I struggle to know what is the best way versus what is a way to do it. Um, I saw a talk by Dylan Alcott recently where he was saying that he meets a lot of parents who are very publicly in denial or verbally in denial about their children's disability. So they would, you know, a, a child would be in a wheelchair and they, the parent might say, oh, but they're not disabled because they've got a view of what disability is. Mm -hmm. And Dylan said, yeah, they are. Like, it's quite... Obvious, and I know that there are invisible and visible disabilities, and people disclose or not, and that's up to everybody. But I think it's about being very real about a situation. And so my mum, 
Um, she never lied to me about my illness. She never denied it. She never, um, you know, changed the colour of the photo to make me look different. I don't, you know, I've never had a black and white photo taken of me as a kid, as I see now with parents of kids with ichthyosis who minimise their child's redness by turning it, you know, filtering it or making it black and white. And so I think it's very, um, I think it's very good to be very frank about not not in a hurtful way but just in an honest way mm. that um you know this is your body uh it, it's amazing and capable and um beautiful and it can do a, a lot of things but this is also what it means for you mm. Mm. something um just to add my tiny two cents um you cannot stop the world from happening to your child mm. um and in my experience there is uh, unfortunately a lot of there is so much analogous about the way we don't talk about things like sex crime and the way we also don't want to talk about the uncomfortable parts of sexism. And I think that, I guess my position as a person in all things is that the first step is to shine a torch. Mm. Like the more you can make clear that you are always open for calm discussion, you can always be approached with questions. Um, if you can't at least point to and name problems, you can't even get to a place where you're having open dialogue and then how are you supposed to solve it? I, do, I think more and more and more engagement is the only like, way we can start trying to feel through the dark. Which seems counterintuitive because you don't want to draw awareness, but yes. we're going to see it anyway. Yeah, it's everywhere. It is the world. It is absolutely pervasive. Mm. If you do not give your kids an alternate narrative, they will inevitably have to figure out their own because they are receiving. It is being shoved into their eyeballs and down their throats. What is the dominant? Mm. But also showing your children, uh, children like them or adults like them and what's mm. possible and that it's okay. Mm. Well, we have two minutes. Do we just, like, two minutes it and see if we can get a, a question out in that Surely time? Surely, yeah, yeah, Let's yeah. do it. Hey, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, in terms of, like, personally, how do you deal with, I suppose, the flip side of, of the, I suppose, hidden disdain for people that do abide by the capitalist patriarchal views of beauty who do do like the cosmetic procedures or wear all the makeup and things that you feel personally is counter like intuitive and against what you're fighting for mm. how do you personally deal with uh like seeing people like that or or having them in your life mm. i went to an event once where the um the two door prizes the first one was oh, no. cosmetic procedure. And the second one was a box of beauty products like oils and serums and stuff. I won the second one um, and I couldn't use any of it, but I also didn't want to talk to them and say, I, don't want, I can't use this, so I'm going to give it back. Because then I would have got the, oh, but they're natural products and, you know, it's better than using paraffin because paraffin's going to kill you. Um, <laughs> And anyway, I ended up just taking it and then I, you know, bitched about it later. And I gave, um, <laughs> and now even, and, and I gave my, my friends a whole heap of the products that I couldn't use. Um, so, yeah, the, there's that. But, I, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I just think that for me, and I know this has been recorded, I think that I, I have a bit of sadness for people that want to change their faces that can't be themselves. Mm. And as much as I want to add on to that, it's on the tip of my tongue. We have to wrap it oh, up. Is that the last thing that's going to that be is, said? Yeah. So I was going to say something really controversial. You know, me so too. I, I want to. I want to say it so badly, but yeah. <laughs> the timer is saying things. I've I've been warned. So thank you so much for all attending. I really appreciate it. <laughs> we are signing our books out the front. Oh yes. Yes. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Fleck. <laughs> Thank you. There's a book. Oh, no, it went well. <laughs> All right.